Hello, so I'm Jim Saluka from Indiana University. I'm a, a senior scientist and a, a computational biologist and computational chemist. I'm um, going to talk today about coupled physiological based pharmacokinetic modeling uh, with tissue and subcellular metabolic modeling. Uh, on the right screen, there we go. Start off with the acknowledgement. Uh, Dr. Glazier is the head of the Biocomplexity Institute and nominally my boss. Uh, I particularly want to call out Machik Swat, who is the lead developer of CompuCell, Dr. Sherry Clendenen, who is a microscopist and liver uh, expert, and Dr. Xiao Fu, who did, uh, was a grad student working on this project. Uh, in addition, uh, John Wambai at uh, the US EPA, who did uh, a lot of in the, the initial work on the PBPK model, whole bottle body PBPK model. And as always, got to acknowledge the funding from EPA, NIH, NSF, and, and Indiana University. Uh, so uh, I'm sure you've heard this in this class. Uh, what is the background and why would we want to develop computational models? Uh, for one thing, a computational model is a great test of our understanding of a biological system. Uh, the first thing that happens usually when you try to set up a computational model is you discover all the things we don't know. So it helps identify gaps in knowledge. Uh, longer term and, and a, a more recent use of computational models is to reduce the use of experimental animals, uh, in particular to be able to do inter, uh, in vitro to in vivo extrapolation. That is, can you learn enough in a cell culture model? Uh, that you can extrapolate to to uh, animals, the whole body, uh, and reduce the number of animals you need to do a particular experiment. And finally, computation models also often useful for mapping data from one scale to another. In the biomedical domain, often you only have data at a very crude scale from blood concentrations, uh, a single scanning, uh, a single image uh, from some scanning study. And uh, you would like to be able to map that data into data at some other scale within the model. I'm going to be talking largely about the liver. The liver is a, the, the center of metabolism in the body. It's the key clearance organs for both drugs and xenobiotics. Uh, it is a common uh, source of injury. Uh, Drug-induced liver toxicity is a common problem for both therapeutics uh, and also for xenobiotics. Many xenobiotics could cause liver damage. And then finally, I'm going to be talking about acetaminophen as our uh, model compound. Uh, acetaminophen, I will call it APAP for uh, N-acetylpyramidophenol. Uh, it's a widely used over-the-counter uh, analgesic. It is a leading cause of liver failure in the USA. It has a very narrow therapeutic index. The therapeutic index is the ratio of the toxic dose to the therapeutic dose. And for acetaminophen, the therapeutic index is somewhere between 100 and 1,000, which is unusually low, uh, as I said, for an over-the-counter drug. Uh, this often causes problems because the acetaminophen is also co often co-dosed with other things. For instance, Paraset by weight is about 99% acetaminophen. Uh, sometimes people who have taken Paraset also take acetaminophen on the side, even though they should, not realizing that there's already acetaminophen in their Paraset. And it's very easy to get to a, a liver damaging dose of acetaminophen. So acetaminophen has rather complicated uh, pharmacokinetics and, and is extensively metabolized primarily in the liver, but also in other organs. Uh, here's our acetaminophen here. It is sulfated and glucuronidated in phase two uh, uh, processes that makes acetaminophen much more water soluble and in general phase two metabolism, the goal is to make the compound more water-soluble so the body can clear it. In addition to the phase two metabolisms, uh, acetaminophen is oxidized by cytochrome P450 to N-acylparaquinone imine, which is a highly reactive electrophile, reacts with glutathione in the cells, for example, or, or, as well as thiol-containing proteins, uh, giving a conjugate. At high uh, exposure levels, this becomes a toxic pathway that overwhelms the phase two pathways and start to build up more and more phase one pathway. Uh, and this pathway leads to hepatocyte death and, and uh, liver failure. Uh, in humans, as I said, it's metabolized. This is human data. This is ADME data. This is concentration versus time for acetaminophen itself after a single oral dose. And then of the uh, sulfate in red and the glucuronide in green, a little bit of a delay. Uh, almost no acetaminophen is ever cleared through the urine. Uh, what's found in the urine is the 
sulfate and the glucuronide. So this is the kind of data that you also often would have in a clinical trial or in a clinical setting, which is concentration versus time, concentration in the blood versus time for some dose of a drug. Can we use this kind of data, this very high, high level coarse grain data to make predictions down at the, the level of the organ of interest? In this case, it's going to be the liver. So biology is multiple scale. What we have is information at the whole body scale, actually blood in the whole body. And what we really want is what's going down, going on down here at some level of a metabolic or, or signaling or uh, some other pathway that's a molecular pathway at the subcellular level. So we have a range of scales going from the animal to uh, an organ scale, down to the tissue scale, down to uh, you know a small portion of tissue, multiple cells down to a very small number of cells interacting with each other, and then finally to whatever's going on inside an individual cell. So we take our model in, attempt to divide, uh, attempt to create a model that can handle all of these scales simultaneously. Can we do something like PBPK modeling for the whole body scale, uh, a large model for an organ, a somewhat zoomed in model within the organ, uh, ultimately zooming into what's happening between individual pairs of cells, and then finally what's happening inside of a cell. And I'm sure you've seen a slide something like this, that uh, the modeling workflow starts with some observations, goes through the process of building a biological model and then a mathematical model, and then finally instantiating that model in some computational framework. Uh, verification that your comp computational framework matches your mathematical model running some simulation, verifying that a valid, doing validation, verifying that matches your biological observations, and then finally making some prediction, which leads to some new knowledge of, about the biological system. So I think we're ready. We get started with uh, actually developing a multi-scale multimodal model. Uh, some design characters we'd like to have is like for instance, starts with, we'd like to use standard tools and specifications for a particular biological scale. We prefer not to hand roll our own code. It's hard to share, it's hard to validate, it's hard to reuse. We'd like our code to be annotatable so that we can assign biological meaning to our individual entities, especially at the level of code where you get cryptic names because they're basically uh, variable names within some code. And finally, for a multi-scale model, we'd like to be able to run the model at individual scales all by itself without necessarily needing the other scales functioning. This makes it much easier to debug a model uh, when you're looking at a little piece of it instead of the entire uh, whole model. Uh, and some advantages of using existing tools is that they can be used for creation, execution, parameter fitting. And I'm sure you've heard a lot about this in, in your training in Kaposi and other tools. It's much easier if someone else has worked out the bug so you can focus on getting something done. You also have the advantage that you can reuse someone else's models. And it's also great if you can use a tool that includes something like an annotation standard so you can properly identify uh, the entities in your model. So here's the start of our multi-scale model. We'll have a scale for the whole body, a scale for the liver, and a scale for within individual cells within the liver. So at our whole body scale, we'll use a physiologically based pharmacokinetic modeling, PBPK. Common approach, it's an ODE-based approach to modeling the entire uh, body. At the tissue scale, we'll use a virtual tissue, comp cell 3D, which will include uh, blood flow in cells, and at the subcellular metabolic level, uh, we'll use uh, ODEs in uh, subcellular signaling, and, and it's, in this case, uh, metabolism of acetaminophen. But as I said, we can do the PBPK and using SBML or any ODE modeling tool. We can also use SBML to do the subcellular action kinetics modeling, and we'll use CompuCell as the intermediate uh, scale in the model. So we'll start off with the PBPK model. Uh, we could spend an entire week doing PBPK modeling. It's pretty widely used in uh, pharmaceutical research and toxicology research. Uh, there are a number of existing tools. Some of them are commercial and very expensive. Uh, we're going to use SBML. 
the main goal of the PBPK model is to help understand data like this. Uh, this is similar to the sedimentifin plot I showed earlier. So this is time versus concentration in the blood for some compound after a single dose. You get some rise in the concentration in the blood and then it tails off at the end. There are a number of ways of describing this curve, the time, the temp to the maximum concentration, concentration, the actual maximum concentration, the area under the curve, the time it spends within the therapeutic range and so forth. So one issue here though, is this is just blood concentration. We'd like to have some estimate for how much is actually in individual compartments within the body. So that's where the PBPK modeling comes in. This is one layout of the PBPK of a PBPK model. Typically, you have venous and arterial blood, uh, a lung, and often a heart, which basically just transfers compound blood from the venous branch back to the arterial branch, and then blood flow through compartments uh, of the body. Uh, in our particular case, we're going to do the liver, the gut, the kidney, mostly because this gut is where the compound will come in. Liver and kidney are major clearance organisms. And then rest is represents the rest of the body. In addition, the kidney can clear via uh, the tubules. The gut has aluminum, which is where our compound will start off. It's an oral dose. And the liver has the possibility of metabolism. So these two uh, blue ovals here on the right are two clearance mechanisms. PBK, PBBK modeling is relatively straightforward. There are some caveats to how things have to be done. In general, the rate of change of a compound within a compartment is related to the volumetric flow, QC, divided by the volume of the compartment times the amount of uh, compound in the compartment. So negative sign here, so this is an equation for exiting a simple compartment. Compartments, compartments that are more complicated like organs, you need to take into, thing, take into account things like what fraction of the compound is actually free in the serum as opposed to what's bound to Serum proteins, that's this fraction unbound in protein, uh, fraction unbound to proteins in serum. You also need to take into account the amount, the ratio of the blood, red blood cell volume to the uh, plasma volume within the blood, and whether or not the red blood cells themselves are carrying. So in a compartment, you get a somewhat more complex uh, equation. But you can then basically take this set of equations and start building up your entire model. So for instance, this venous compartment uh, transferring compound into the lungs is a relatively straightforward. Uh, the arterial flow, the total heart flow, divided by the volume of the venous compartment times the mass in the venous compartment. So it's fairly straightforward. For a tissue compartment, it's a little more uh, Complicated, so here's exit from the rest of the body equation. We have to take into account the fraction unbound and the ratio of blood to uh, ratio of blood to plasma. Uh, and K rest is the partition coefficient, which is an equilibrium constant for partitioning between tissue and, and organ. All of the organ compartments will have this K. Uh, and finally, you have specialized transfers, for instance, uptake from the gut lumen, which is usually just modeled as a first order ODE. It's the uh, some rate constant times the amount in the lumen. Some clearance for uh, tubules in the kidney. It's a relatively straightforward equation based on the glomerular filtration rate, which is a compound dependent parameter, unfortunately. And then finally, you may have a very complex set of equations representing metabolism within uh, the liver or any other organ. And here's one way of doing that. This is just a simple ODE saying that, this, that the a first order ODE is metabolism for free drug within the organ. So as I said, we're gonna be using SBML for this particular model. Uh, I think this class is probably pretty familiar with that. Uh, SBML is, an is a model building standard uh, that is used by a number of tools, including Capossi and CompuCell, which is what I'll be using. Uh, will also work with SBML methods. The advantages of SBML is among, other than the fact that it's an existing package and there's lots of tools to help you build and run, is that it is annotatable. And unfortunately, it is a, that is a characteristic that is often not extensively used. Uh, we made pretty good use of it in, in this particular model. For instance, there's a front page, you know, brief description of what the model is all about. Uh, when we decide, define a species, uh, this is the concentration of 
sedimentin in the kidney. You can leak the compound to some uh, data, external database or ontology such as Kebi, tells you more about um, the, your compound. If you're doing a compartment, this is the liver compartment, you can link it down to the foundational model of anatomy uh, definition for the liver. So in long term, it helps to robustly identify what's in your model. And, and actually, in the long term use of that is that hopefully someone will be able to, in the future, make use of your model again because they know what you are actually thinking the model is about. And finally, SBML is shareable. So these two, the two SBML models that I'll be talking about are available in biomodels, the sentiment and metabolism, and this PVBK model that we're talking about right now. So that uh, SBML lets us do best practices in our modeling for multiple scales within this model. So it, we can sit down and write all, all of our ODEs for the transfers between compartments. So for instance, this one here is transfer from uh, the gut lumen into the gut. And this one up here on top is the transfer from the arterial compartment to the liver. Sit down, work your way through, make all your definitions, build it all up. And in, in, uh, I use Coposi to do most of the development. Within that model, there's a lot of parameters and there's a lot of, of entities that we're interested in. Uh, these black variables are the ones we're interested in, in predicting. There is a set of parameters that are specific to the compound, the, the partition with the partition coefficients and the compartments, the amount of binding to uh, protein and the amount of binding to red blood cells within it. So these blue parameters are all compound specific and would change with the compound. All of these red compounds are specific to the organ, or excuse me, to the, the animal that's being modeled, both in terms of whether you're talking about a human or a mouse, as well as in terms of how big the human or mouse is. So these parameters are volumetric flows, blood flows, and volumes of organs. And these are all scalable by not only species, but also by body weight. And typically, these models are scaled by body weight. So body weight is an input. Uh, parameter and these red variables all get rescaled given that input parameter. Oh, I went too far. Along. So we can put this in and uh, get all the equations in the Copasi. Uh, and here's Copasi's nice, pretty output of what all the equations look like. Uh, we can then run this model. In addition, we can load in to Copasi the uh, some human data. This is the same human data that's shown on the earlier slide, and that's the little plus marks or human uh, serum level concentrations for a 1.6 gram dose of acetaminophen and a 68 kilogram human. The solid line is the capacity fit. Using capacity's ability to, to uh, do various fitting tools onto particular uh, parameters in the model and things that were fit with a metabolic rate in the liver. Uh, the rate of gut absorption since the kidney, liver, and rest uh, uh, partition coefficients, partition between the, the blood and the, those compartments, uh, and the uh, QGFR, with the clearance rate in the kidney. You see, we get a very nice fit. Uh, this fit is actually much, much better than the, the accuracy of the experimental data. Uh, typically, this ADME type data has quite large error bars associated with it. So, again, this is just the result of. Parameter fitting uh, within Copasi, and that gives us kind of a starting point for a set of parameters that we can use later on. Uh, and again, a summary of so this is uh, predicted versus the experimental for this particular model. Getting behind here in my other slides. So that's our first model. It's uh, runnable on its own, uh, it can be fitted with experimental data, it's annotated, uh, and can be shared. Uh, now we'll move on to the second scale. So this would be the tissue scale. Uh, here we're modeling the uh, tissue of the liver. Uh, the liver, great big organ just underneath your rib cage. Uh, it's divided into uh, objects called lobules. A lobule is, is in the vicinity of a millimeter across. And, uh, an individual lobule is shown here. There are two blood flows into a lobule. There's an arterial and a venous flow, and that's shown in the PBPK model from there's an arterial flow straight to the liver, and there's also arterial flow to the gut and then venous flow out of the gut to the liver. So there's two input flows. 
and then the output venous flow. Uh, this is a, a reconstructed microvasculature. So these are the, the capillaries called sinusoids in the liver. It's a very dense matrix. Uh, to a first approximation, the gaps in here are one cell wide. So every cell in the liver has at least two pipes going by it, at least, often three. Uh, it's an extremely densely uh, vascularized organ. And this is a little image of what it looks like. You take a microscope and look at the surface of the liver. So these are sinusoids uh, with red blood cells moving through them. You can see how densely packed this, this capillary network is. You can see that some sinusoids have very high flow. You can see the red blood cells. Some have very low, slow flow. Some appear to not have any red blood cells in them at all. It's a very complicated vascular pattern. Uh, but we're going to use a much simpler one. We're going to reduce it in complexity quite a bit. Uh, so to model this scale, we're going to use the cellular POTS model. In particular, we're going to use the cellular POTS implemented in CopCell 3D. I'm not going to go into great deal to detail about POTS. It's a lattice-based uh, modeling system. Uh, here we show four cells as each being some set of pixels, and the individual cells interact with each other at the uh, at their interfaces. One of the nice things about CompuCell is that you can import and associate SPML models with it. In this case, this is a little example of a cell that's wandering about and progressing through this embedded cell cycle SPML model. And you can see the, uh, the state of the cell cycle changing and the cells divide. Uh, the daughter cell then gets a new copy of this model and the process just continues. So each, see they're a little bit out of phase with each other. The cells are growing and they're growing based on this embedded SBML model that each cell has. Uh, we're not gonna use cell cycle. Uh, we're gonna use something a little different. So our liver compartment is gonna be simplified down to just a single pipe, uh, single uh, sinusoid lined with green hepatocytes with blood flow flowing through it with red being red blood cells and blue being serum. There's two inputs. There's the arterial and venous flow. Uh, and so this will be our tissue scale model. Within this model, we have a, a coarse, implemented a coarse grain PDE for transfer of acetaminophen between various items. So for instance, two red blood cells in contact can transfer material between them. A red blood cell in a serum portion can transfer material. A serum portion and red blood cells can both transfer to the hepatocyte. And this arrow back to itself just means that two adjacent red blood cells can transfer between themselves. So we have a set of forward and reverse rate constants. Uh, in addition, we also have a, an active transport implemented between serum portions and the hepatocytes. There is some evidence of the sediment and use an active importer. So we can implement this in CompuCell. Uh, and this is a little uh, model of a, a test, a standalone run. And actually, here's an animation. So here's our, our pipe. We're, this upper version is going to be red blood cells and serum portion moving through the pipe. This lower one is the concentration of acetaminophen. Uh, this model just gives a pulse of acetaminophen and then removes the pulse. And so in a moment there, so here comes acetaminophen. Concentration goes up in the hepatocytes. Eventually, we turn off the input flow of the sedimentin, and now the sedimentin is bleeding back out of the hepatocytes. This particular model doesn't have a metabolism turned on. And so after some length of time, it will uh, continue to bleed out and wash out of the system. So that's the standard alone run that lets us calibrate things. The model is basically calibrate on it taking one second for ser uh, blood to pass through this length of pipe. Uh, in addition, it also has both the arterial and the venous input. And you can actually see that in the simulation uh, that there's actually a higher concentration up this upper edge because that's the arterial or the uh, venous input. And so you get this asymmetry across it, depending on which blood flow is closer to that edge of the cell. This is not a particularly precise representation of a red blood cell, uh, but th we think it's adequate because it does give us compartments that can uh, carry the compound differently than the serum itself does. So we have our whole body PBK, we have our subcellular uh, CompuCell or, or multicellular CompuCell blood flow sinusoid model. And now we'll work on our subcellular metabolic, the 
metabolic modeling. So here's our earlier uh, metabolic pathway for acetaminophen, the phase two and the phase one metabolism. What we're going to do is in, uh, embed a copy of this into each of our hepatocytes. So every he hepatocyte will have its own copy of this little reaction network. Uh, this is reasonably straightforward. We model all of these as Michaelis Menten, so they're saturable if needed. It turned out that in, in uh, the, the concentration domain we were working in, we never reached saturation of any of the metabolic pathways. Uh, again, reasonably straightforward. This is in Kopasi, so once you get it in there, you can run it. And you can at least partially calibrate the model in Kapasi. For instance, uh, here's acetaminophen going down in concentration. Here's the sulfate going up and the glucuronide going up. The ratio between these two compounds is known uh, in, the, uh, in humans and in rodents. So we can calibrate the model to a certain extent to, by get, to get this ratio correct. And of course, making sure we have mass balance, which gets, um, gets us a long way to where we want to be. Uh, what's missing here is we don't actually know how fast the entire process is. We just know what the relative rates are, which is what gives us this, uh, real, this ratio of uh, products. The actual calibration of the overall time scale will have to come from someplace else. Uh, kind of thinking ahead, people are very interested in in vivo to in vitro to in vivo extrapolation. Uh, can you calibrate this scale of a model using a cell culture? The hepatocytes in culture might give you concentration versus time of metabolites for a new xenobiotic, which would let you uh, calibrate your model at this scale before you go to the whole body scale. Okay, so now we have all our pieces. We can stick them all together. So the complete multi-scale model, we have a whole body PDBK, but we're going to replace our liver compartment with our cell sinusoid, and we're going to remove that metabolic clearance pathway from the SPML model because we're going to take care of it elsewhere. Then we're going to embed our metabolic pathway in each of our comp cell cells. And the kind of flow of, of material is there's some amount of APAP coming into the liver compartment, which actually gets delivered to the comp cell compartment. Uh, that delivers it into individual cells. The metabolism takes, uh, takes place. And then unused acetaminophen can be transferred back, but also the glucuronide and sulfates back into the flow model. Uh, the flow model then transfers back to the PBPK model. And actually now we have three PBPK models, one for acetaminophen, one for the glucuronide, and one for the sulfate. So we use, that's how it's all laid out. Uh, there's a, the kind of the process by which it all goes, I should say, in the model. We are modeling both of these input flows. So there's both an arterial flow and a venous flow, and they're scaled properly uh, for the relative flow in, in the body. It's about four to one. Uh, our initial set of parameters came from what we had gotten in the running the individual model standalone. Uh, some of it was based on literature values and some of it was based on uh, random sampling and, and kind of hand tuning about our initial set of parameters. Overall, there's 35 parameters in the model. We have 36 measurements in the human ADME data. That includes that's basically 12 measurements for each of the sulfate, glucuronide, and the parent sediment. Uh, we want outputs here, concentration versus time for our three inputs, the, the parent and the two metabolites. And then there are dozens of internal variables, transfer rates, partition coefficients, of uh, scales, all kinds of things. Uh, we are interested in parameter interactions, parameter identifiability, and uh, also how uncertainty in the input experimental data affects uh, the, the model. So here we have uh, the entire HOLO model running in these three panels here. This is the liver pipe, our hepatocytes. This will be acetaminophen concentration, the glucuronide concentration, the sulfate concentration. These graphs are, this is the whole body um, PVPK ADME output for the uh, APAP and the two metabolites in, the, in blood. This is uh, the PVPK model for the amount of APAP in four of the compartments, the rest of the body, the venous compartment, the kidney, and the gut within the body. And then finally, 
uh, three concentrations of glutathione in as some of the SBML cells, one portal, which is the left side, mid-zonal, the middle, and central, which is the exit end of it. So if we let this run, I should say that this run actually takes about 20 hours on, on uh, four threads. Uh, so this is much faster. The model does a reasonably good job of predicting uh, the metabolite ratios and the whole body scale, but that's being calculated down at the single cell scale. Uh, it's giving predictions of concentration versus time in other tissues. You just, this one outlier curve up here is the amount in the gut. So that's our, our source compartment. And it's giving predictions of how much glutathione is being produced by the toxicity pathway. This is a sublethal dose, and so very little glutathione is produced, but very little glutathione is consumed. Uh, but the amount consumed does change on, depending on where you're at in the pipe. So we have the entire model. It all works. Uh, like I said, we did some, some manual tuning and some, some random hunting about our initial parameter sets. Uh, but overall, we were able to get a pretty good fit. Again, this is the ADME curve, the three compounds versus time in the blood, the, salt, the, uh, the lines of the predictions and the solid, the, uh, the markers are the human data. So we do a reasonably good job of getting the parent and the two metabolites. The next thing we wanted to look at was the sensitivity of the model outputs to the uh, parameters within the model. So uh, parameter sensitivity is basically how much does a particular model output change for some small change in a parameter. Uh, unfortunately, in this particular model, there's a lot of things that are outputs. So in this ADME curve, you could say, well, our output is the maximum concentration of this particular compound, or the Tmax, where the maximum concentration occurs, or the area under the curve, or how long you spend within the therapeutic range or the offset time to reaching therapeutic. So this one set of data has multiple outputs. And so when you're doing uh, parameter uh, sensitivities, you have to decide what you're going to actually do your sensitivity on. Uh, we got lazy and we just did it all. So this is parameter sensitivity. The left-hand column uh, are outputs of the model. So we have the concentration max for acetaminophen, the concentration max for glucuronide, uh, max for this the sulfate, the time to max, the area under the curve for the three, uh, the RMS error between the experimental and the predicted values, the metabolic ratio, this is the, the glucuronide to sulfate, uh, and then uh, an aggregate of all of them. So these are model outputs. Here are all of our model variables broken into, these are the PBDK variables, these are the compressor variables, these are the subcellular variables, and then our sensitivity scale, so black means small changes in the variable have no change on the output. White means small changes in the variable has a measurable uh, effect on the output. And you see there's a fair number of parameters that the model really doesn't care all that much about. Uh, these are a lot of the, the coarse grain PDE uh, forward and reverse rate constants within the comp cell model. Uh, other things it's quite sensitive to uh, here we have the, the total RMS error for this, the blood levels are very sensitive to the fraction unbound, uh, both of acetaminophen and the glucuron and the sulfate. Uh, down at the subcellular level, the, uh, the kinetics of formation of the glucuronide and the sulfate strongly affect the errors in the glucuronide and sulfate ADME curves. So this is all the model outputs versus uh, the parameters in the model, these are all compound dependent parameters. So those, these are the things that would change if we went to another compound. You can also look at the sensitivities for the compound independent. So again, here's our, our model outputs. Here's our uh, volume for our PBBK compartments and the volumetric blood flow. And you see there's a fair number that are insensitive. There are a number that are quite sensitive, in particular, the total cardiac output affects nearly all of the outputs. The total cardiac blood flow affects nearly all of the outputs. Uh, and that makes sense since the total cardiac output controls how fast the blood moves through all the compartments. The faster the heart is, the faster you go through compartments, the faster things tend to clear. We also see the model is quite sensitive to the volume of the liver, just how big the liver is. 
again, that that's, makes sense. The bigger the liver is, the, the more blood's in it, the longer the blood's in it, uh, and the larger the fraction of all of the blood is actually in the liver. So these are the compound dependent, or excuse me, independent parameters. And finally, you could look at something more precise, like just what affects the rate of uh, formation of the toxic metabolite. It's actually the metabolite's not toxic. What's toxic is the, the consumption of glutathione is toxic. So here again, we have PBK parameters, the carb cell parameters, the subcellular parameters, and the things that are most, uh, most contributory to the formation of a toxic metabolite uh, is the rate of transport of compound into the hepatocytes. And then the phase one and phase two rate constants. So how fast does phase one go? How fast does phase two go? That makes sense. The faster you make phase two, uh, the less materials available for phase one. The faster you make phase one, the less material of materials available for phase two. Now these are all single uh, parameter sensitive as you change one parameter at a time, typically by a relatively large amount. This model is quite insensitive to very small changes. If you read the literature, they'll often say, change your parameter by a tenth of a percent and see how much your output changes. In this model, of changing something a tenth of a percent has absolutely no effect at all on anything. Changing it 1% usually has no effect. So we were doing 10% changes, relatively large changes. Uh, the model is is relatively robust. It doesn't, it's not tweaky. But these are single single parameter sensitivities. The other thing you can look at is double pairwise parameter sensitivities. Uh, in this case, what you do is you change two parameters at the same time and see how much the output changes. What we have here is all of the parameters versus all of the parameters, PBK, Compcell, subcellular. This color scale, zero is white. So all these areas in white have, what that means is that you can predict the effect of a double change just from the two single changes. The double change is additive relative to the two single changes. So the, in, the parameters are not interacting with each other. These color uh, regions are where the parameters do interact with each other, and you cannot predict the double change from the two single changes. The triangular regions are between the same or within the same submodel. So this triangular region is parameters in PBPK versus PBPK. The square ranges are a cross model. So this is copy cell parameters versus PBBK parameters. And so these are interesting because these are pairwise interactions of parameters that are not in the same model scale. And indeed, you can look at uh, subcellular versus the whole body. So it's even separated by a scale in the model. And there are some very significant nonlinearities. Uh, in particular, the glucuronidation rate is very dependent on the fraction of bound in the blood, makes sense, uh, as well as the various partition coefficient and, and uh, uh, the partition coefficients and the fraction unbound, things like that. So this identifies sensitivities across multiple scales. Uh, we're still, we did this a couple of years ago actually, and we're still trying to figure out the best way to treat data like this, because now you can think about doing ternary, uh, ternary interactions. Uh, and the other thing that this helps you understand is that there's a, a fairly large number of parameters in the model that the model is insensitive to. So you can spend a little less time trying to figure out what the parameters are because the model is just not a lot sensitive to them. Uh, I'm gonna skip forward and getting a little late. Uh, so this will be uh, my last topic. So one of the things we wanted to try to do is simulate a population. So we made a population of a thousand in silico individuals. For each uh, simulated individual, we picked the parameters, we picked values for each parameter that were within a, a normal truncated normal distribution of coefficient variation of 25%. So basically standard deviation plus or minus 25% about uh, the, the base variable. So every individual had their 30 something parameters randomly sampled from the population. We then ran all 1000 individuals. And here's kind of the, the normal, the middle curve is kind of the normal curve you would see. That's the average response of the 1000 individuals with error bars, standard deviation error bars. 
the nice thing about actually doing it this way, though, is that we can also go into the data and look at, well, who had the highest serum concentration? So this is the one individual out of a thousand that had the highest peak in serum concentration. And this is the one individual out of the 1,000 that had the lowest serum concentrations. So we have the outline. We don't just have the average of the population. We have a, an estimate of where the outline is. So the question is, though, is this actually reproducing uh, real data? So here's the graph we just looked at. This is the published human, uh, one of the published human ADME data. I think this was nine individuals. So again, this is uh, average versus time across the nine individuals and the standard deviation of the measure of the variability between individuals. Uh, it also no doubt includes variability in the assay, measurement assay as well. So I, at first blush, those look pretty similar. And then you can get really lazy like I was when I did this. And instead of actually graphing them, I just made one of them transparent and put it on top of the other. So that's the two graphs, one on top of the other. Uh, this in the middle, you see experimental versus predicted averages and standard deviations. You see they're pretty much identical. Uh, there is no difference between the prediction and uh, the experimental data, especially given the error bars. It's absolutely there. Given that we're reproducing the population variability, our 1,000 people versus the nine that were in this clinical study, uh, we can say where make a prediction of where that one in a thousand person is that has very high APAP levels uh, and the one in a thousand has very low APAP levels. Uh, we've looked at what causes, so what makes this person very high? And this is a person that's clearing slowly. So the, in the random sampling of parameters, uh, it's just a combination of the, the phase one and phase two reaction rate constants for this individual are, are low. In addition, uh, his uptake rate is, is low. Uh, this person's clearing very fast. They actually had very fast metabolic rates. Very fast, meaning that the, the, the VMAX only changed by at most 25%. So it's not like the metabolic rate went up by a log or two log or anything like that. But there's enough just variability if you change enough parameters in the model by just a relatively small amount uh, to get people that behave much differently than the average person in the population. Uh, I am at 43 minutes, so I think I will stop there and put up the, the thank you slide again for all the people that have helped me out. And I'm uh, glad to take any questions if anyone has any. Um, I have a short question. Could you maybe mm -hmm. um, explain how the um, uh, scaling was handled? So the scaling of the different rates and also maybe the concentrations. Uh, okay, let's see. One thing is, some years ago, there NIH wanted multi-scale models, and they went into a, a long discussion about how you couple across scales. And what people didn't kind of click on very quickly was that concentration is scale independent. Concentration is an intensive parameter that has, does not matter how much, how big the thing is. So in our coupling between this model and this model, if we couple via concentration, there is no other scheme. We don't need to know how big this compartment is relative to this compartment because concentration is scale. It's an intensive, comp uh, intensive property that's scale independent. So you have in this particular model, we had the advantage that if we couple via concentration scale is there is no scaling. If you're doing a mechanical model, then you're going to have scaling problems. But in this model, it just does not, we just don't get it. Our base scale we set based on the assumption that it takes one second for blood to flow through the pipe, which is partially based on the, the animation I showed earlier that. The velocity through the pipes is, is highly variable, but one second is a reasonable average. That tells us that then in CompuCell sets a speed limit because the CompuCell model, the POTS model in general can only run so fast. So you run it as fast as you can until stuff starts to break. And then you scale that to be one second. And however long it, it takes for this guy to get through here is one second. Uh, it ended up being 300 Monte Carlo steps for one second here. 
So we step all of the, the, the this model and this model by one three hundredth of a second every copy cell step. And so that's our time scaling. And it was limited by this part of the model. This part of the model is by far the computationally intensive. The SPML models are blazingly fast. So that's how we got to uh, scaling. Concentration is scale independent, so you can you can transfer it from big scales to little scales without doing anything at all. Uh, and then the the limitations of POTS, which says you a uh, Monte Carlo step has to be at least uh, this often, and that sets our time scale. Does that answer your question? Yes, thank you, Jim. I have a a related question. Okay. Um, maybe I did not understand this completely well, but um. By the way, this is a great presentation. Thank you very much. This is this is a great motivation. I hope for everybody. Um, so I, my my question is related to the CompuCell three D part, the 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 liver, and mm -hmm. you you're modeling a certain length of the of sinusoid, but of course yeah. the whole. And I understand that you're coupling through concentration, so concentrations are. Are are the, are the same no matter the size, but you have to account for how much the li the total liver is is um, metabolizing, right? So it cannot just be that little segment. So how 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 is that being? Well, no, again, actually, you can because it's concentration. So our assumption, though, is, but you're right. There is an assumption there. The assumption there is that the liver actually could be represented by. I, I, it, you know, a million of these little pipes. Okay, but we're treating them all the same. Okay, but you're that, right. That's... It, 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 a model that that we have done a little bit of work on, and it just kind of running into problems with complexity is this model. Okay, yeah, yeah. So here we have a a central vein drain. Blue is the input blood sources. Red is the sinusoids, and then green are the hepatocytes. And we kind of this is a partial cutaway. So now you get you get long paths, you get short paths, you get paths that are straight off of the portal triad versus ones that have this more circuitous route. And you can calculate, well, you can estimate, I wouldn't quite say you can calculate blood velocities based on one of these topologies. So here the coloration is how fast blood is moving in a particular sinusoid. Right at the very end, they get the blood gets going really, really fast because all of these pipes that are created at the periphery are, are anastomosing down. So here we have you know, eight pipes, and eventually it anastomizes down to one pipe. So there's difference in blood velocity as your what we basically model is from the periphery in as just that single pipe, and we don't have this complexity of, of different flow rates. Right. Uh, so yes, the it, the model could be more complex. Certainly. Yeah, yeah, but I mean that's that. I think that answers the question. By the way, this this uh, doing the whole sinusoid sounds uh, really really cool. Yeah, <laughs> a lot of work. Yeah, there is a the problem we ran into here is we know that there's portal triads. So at these heck the, the vertices, there's an artery, a vein, uh, and a, a, a bile duct. What we don't know is what's in between. What's on this edge? Right. And what we found is we kind of made two models. One is this edge is just a sinusoid. It's eight to 10 microns across. It's just like everybody else. Or you say, well, let's double the diameter here. Uh, and if you double the diameter, blood flow goes up as the fourth power. Oh. So that basically makes this entire edge able to supply just like a vertex does. And when you compare those two, it makes a huge difference. <laughs> and these velocities just go all over the place. And so... We, we kind of stop there is that nobody really knows what this pipe out here looks like and, and it makes a huge difference. The other thing we've looked at is, so this is blood velocity. Uh, there's a model, I'm not going to be able to remember the name of it now, that predicts hematocrit sorting. Every time the vessel branches, what fraction of the red blood cells goes this way and what fraction goes this way. And so we've run this particular layout in that predictor and the hematocrits are all over the place. The hematocrit goes from, and some of them have 25% hematocrit, some have 75% hematocrit. Hmm. So, you know, the amount of oxygen in the pipe is changing depending on where the pipe is, depending on how many red blood cells there are, is how much oxygen is going to be there. On the other hand, if it's got a lot of red blood cells, it has less serum, so it has less compound in it. 
and uh, that's kind of where we're sitting right now is we're trying to figure out how, how well, we this is in a logical way. <laughs> As you said, that's one of the reasons why modeling is so good, that it shows the questions that need to be answered experimentally. Yep. That nobody has ever thought of measuring that makes a big difference. Yeah. Now, what I want to do is uh, this. Uh, uh, has anybody ever used a, a uh, blood oxygen monitor, the little thing you clip on your yeah, finger? Yeah, yeah. So it's just a red LED and an uh, IR LED, and a red sensitive and an IR sensitive. It's super simple, mechanically, it, it trivial little device, but it'll tell you what your your the oxygen saturation of your blood is. Uh, what we're trying to do is is get our in vitro person. Where is it? Uh, this is the one. There it is. This experiment down here, what if we illuminated this with red and IR LEDs? Could we get the hematocrit in an in individual red blood cell and watch it as it moves through the pipe? Say so that, you know, that guy right there, we're going to follow that red blood cell. And can we see the, the uh, PO2 dropping on that individual red blood cell? And then uh -huh. look at comparisons across the slide and say, you know, sometimes. Uh, there's a lot of drop in PO2 on some sinusoids. Sometimes it's really low. These ones where there's like right here where the, the, the flow kind of starts and stops. Are these red blood cells totally depleted of O2 because they've been sitting there for such a long period of time? Yeah. Anyway, is that, you know, that would that get us to understanding flow through this complex net network if we actually knew what the oxygen concentration was. Okay. Anyway. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, I think we um, unfortunately need to need to continue our our schedule. Uh, let's thank again uh, Jim for really great, fantastic talk. Uh, very good motivation. Well, you're welcome, and uh, enjoy the rest of your course. Thank you. Thanks, thank you. Dave.